Hi, good, af good afternoon everybody. Welcome to this Film EU talk. My name is Felix and today we sit down with Anla Ax. After building a career in television and media, she took a leap and started her own production company called Roses Are Blue in 2017. Together with the co-founder Matthias Koppens and entertainment company Caviar, they make creative and cutting-edge programs for Belgian television. Hi Anne, Hi. thank you for being here. How are you? I'm very good, thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> well, my name, as I said, is Felix Vloebergs. I'm a student at Campus Nairafi, um, so I'm very glad to talk to a professional in the sector. <laughs> um, and of course, I want to welcome everybody who is watching from around Europe, because we have some international viewers as well. Hi. Um, <laughs> you can also leave um, a question for Anna later in this conversation, and we will um, go about it in a Q&A later on. Um, Tamara should be here as well, my co-host. Yeah, it hello, is. I'm Tamara, and today I will be your chat moderator for the questions. If you have any questions for Anna, make sure to leave them in the chat, and I will make sure to relay them to her at the Q&A. And thank you, Anna, for being here today with us. Thank you, Tamara. <laughs> thank you. We'll get uh, back later at Tamara. All right. but now let's talk about you, Anna. Um, well, I want to jump back in time and maybe talk about how you started in television because you had quite a career already. Um, did you always have a connection to TV and media? Oh, um, I think as a child, I always wanted to be a journalist or a psychologist. Didn't mm. want to know which side I would choose. Um, I wasn't that big film addict uh, at the time, but I was kind of fan of uh, big television shows. When we were kids, um, we used to watch two or three channels, that was it. And uh, on a Saturday night, we, we took a bath as kids and, we and then we went, uh, we sat in front of the television and we could watch these Dutch television shows, which is the big television. Mm -hmm. you, we didn't have that in Belgium back then. And the uh, Netherlands, was it? And so it was in the yeah. Netherlands, okay. yes. Um, and we could watch this, this in Belgium. And I think that's where I started to feel a little bit passionate about uh, television shows. Mm. And uh, what I kind of a background did you have uh, at home? Um, my dad was um, an entrepreneur in glass packaging, and mm. my mom actually um, was an actress and a drama teacher. Um, she even won. Um, it was a, a show yeah. in uh, on the public broadcaster in the '60s called On Deck the Stairs, Discover the Stars. I think you should. It's like the same like uh, Belgium's Got Talent, okay, but then yeah. from the 60s and then she, mm. she won it. Um, so um, I was in this creative environment and, and uh, we always were encouraged to follow our dreams and mm. to be okay. entrepreneur. But I hear an actress, so a creative aspect, but also an entrepreneur. So yeah. kind of came together in you. Cause, um, can you maybe explain your first steps into television or what, what kind of st stuff you were doing back then? Well, um, I actually started to study journalism, mm. yeah. um, um, mm. not the psychology, the, <laughs> the, the, the journalism mm. uh, part. Um, and someday I ended up as an intern on a variety show. Um, mm. It was a big variety show. And I was like, oh my God, everything is coming together here. I like this. And I was particularly charmed by um, the guy, not the guy himself, because I was too young, he was too old for me, but <laughs> by the guy who was um, in control on the set and was telling everybody what to do. Turned out he was the producer and then I thought I want to be like him. I want to become what he is doing. I don't want to be a writer or a journalist. Yeah. I want to become a producer. A producer. Can you maybe, for the people who don't know, because producer, um, it also took me a while to know what those people actually do and it's, it's kind of a vague term in, in the film and television sector. What, what do producers actually do? I think the main um, task of a producer is he's in charge of everything that's um, within the production televi television production process. Mm -hmm. As in, he's responsible for the budget. He has to make sure that there is a set. He has to make sure that there are people. Um, and within those, all those aspects there are, of course, other people who will be responsible for those um, mm -hmm. aspects. But he, he's the one or she's the one who brings it all together, uh, making up the budget and controlling from the start to the end of the process, production process to be in charge of it. And then after that internship, you went on producing for television? Or uh, actually, I started as an assistant, production yeah, you have assistant. To start somewhere yeah, I started down down a runner and then a production mm -hmm. assistant and then. Uh, mm -hmm climbed up um, and became, um, I think, after like, I was maybe already 10 years of 
for 15 years in business mm -hmm. and I became head of production and then okay. become a producer and then um, executive producer and then I became a head of production. And you're the one in charge of, of ma making sure that the program is, is made in a way. Yeah, and yeah. the I think the, the main thing about you get a producer and then it's, it's, it's also a difference between fiction and non-fiction, but in non-fiction the executive producer um, controls also the content, mm -hmm. is uh, in charge of N um, production phases and also of um, all the content. Yeah. So he's really the end responsible, which is nice because it's often it's about big projects and it's uh, that's yeah, nice what is thing. actually the difference between executive producing and, and just producer in itself? Because those terms are also used. Yeah, it depends also mm. in what context. Because, yeah. but most in non-fiction, an, an executive producer is more like a showrunner, yeah. who is in control of the whole concept. Mm -hmm. So he um, is also for the budget, but also for the content. So he's the the end responsible. Okay, but then after years for working, um, I think VTM is it the the. Not the public uh, broadcaster in Belgium, but the commercial the one. Commercial, yeah. um, you eventually co-founded your own production company. How did that came about? Well, I, I traveled a bit around in the television mm. landscape in Flanders, which is not such, such a big landscape, but mm -hmm. um, an interesting one. Um, and I ended up in, I think, 2012 something. Um, at TV, TV Basel, it was an internal uh, production company of the of VTM, the commercial, the biggest commercial channel um, at the time, uh, still is. Mm -hmm. um, and I became head of production, um, and somehow we managed to become, I think, the biggest production company in Flanders uh, back then. So it was quite challenging. It was nice. It was yeah. uh, we, we learned a lot, but. We we bumped into the borders of we were all imbi ambitious people. There were a lot of creative people, and we bumped into the borders of this commercial um, channel because we couldn't produce for other channels and we couldn't go abroad. Yeah, because we were stuck with like one channel actually. Yeah, then. and I hmm. we felt oh that is becoming becoming a little bit too small for us mm -hmm. um, because uh, we wanted to conquer the world. Of course, <laughs> we were young and and uh, we wanted to become uh, more than that. And at the time, um, Matthias Koppes, who is um, a famous television host, but also a very talented TV maker, um, was working there as well. And he came to me like, this thing is too small for me. We have to do something else. Mm -hmm. I want to start my own television company, production company. Do you want to join me? I was like, OK, <laughs> why not? Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we joined forces with two other um, very talented TV makers and we found, um, we talked to Bert Hamelink, who was a friend yeah. of Matthias back then and he was already... He's from Caviar then. Yeah, he was the CEO of Caviar, yeah. which was already a very um, well-known and, and rewarded um, entertainment uh, company, mm -hmm. mainly focusing on film and commercials. Yeah, because that's something else and what, what you may yeah, mainly yeah. do, non-fiction. Um, yeah. I know Caviar mainly from fiction and television series, movies. Yes. So how did that? Well, he he thought that is mm. something that we don't have in the group. So that was a, a, a great addition to uh, mm. to the company. So we started Roses Are Blue within the Caviar group as a non-fiction uh, television uh, company. And the main purpose and, and our main target or our, our dream actually was to make um, original. And that was a little bit different that at the time, uh, other television companies in, in Flanders. We wanted to make original local content, original content uh, with a, f a, a strong focus uh, on the international market. So we mm -hmm. wanted to sell our um, formats as fast as we could uh, on the so international you only market. Make original formats and don't buy formats and then make them for the yeah. Belgian television. That's yeah, okay. we don't want to, we didn't want to buy formats. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to create our own formats and then um, make sure that they, they could travel around the world. Okay. And therefore, Caviar was the perfect partner. They, they, they were already a, um, uh, uh, an international company. So they had the network. So it w yeah, they yeah. had the network, so it was a perfect match. Okay. Actually. Well, I think we have a show reel ready um, and we can look at what you did in actually only seven years yes. for programs. I'm here now. Yes. Is it weer te doen eigenlijk? Holy shit! Ik 
Jairus, der kan du knie. Right, that's quite a lot for only being uh, in business for seven years, I'd say. It was just yeah. from last year, actually. <laughs> oh, right. oh, oh, yeah, actually, <laughs> okay. these are all pretty new it was indeed. Our wow, last, uh, you guys show are busy. <laughs> yeah. And it also um, struck me that it was uh, a lot of different concepts. You had like the, the programs in studio, like the Code van Koppens and uh, Eniar Gratis. Th those are in studio programs and are, I would say, more entertainment, but then there's also the traveling programs. Um, a term you often use is uh, factual entertainment. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, actually, we make um, mainly non-fiction or, mm -hmm. or uh, of, um, entertainment, and we everything we make for us is it has to be authentic television, it has to be feel-good television, yeah. and it has to be growth entertainment. So for a broader audience yeah. with the international potential, mm -hmm. um, the studio entertainment or the the more recognizable maybe entertainment like the Code of Ancopus is mm. the, the uh, international title is a way out is, is one part and the factual entertainment is more like down the road for instance yeah. um, that's where you, you, you it's like a docu-series mm -hmm. you, you, you tell a story about a group of people in, in this case yeah, for the people who don't know it it's, it's um, actually kind of a road trip um, the host takes a road trip with six people I think um, with Down syndrome mm -hmm. and um, and makes them do challenges makes them go over yeah explore their own boundaries and um, go on an adventure actually yeah. which is a lovely Give them program. A trip that they will never yeah. life-changing mm -hmm. um, trip um, and the, the you call it like factual entertainment because you make this for this big audience and it's mm -hmm. entertaining to watch it's primetime television so um, it's not the big entertainment show, but it's called factual entertainment because of that. Yeah, it is um, indeed very um, entertaining television and also with sometimes a little bit of humor in it. But it also hits a deeper emotion and it's, it's about something, uh, I'd say. Well, that's, that's actually what we always yeah. try to do. We try to make you care about what we make and, mm -hmm. and we, let we try to make it matter because mm -hmm. that's what we think it's important mm -hmm. for us. It's an important thing when we make television. Yeah, and the, the show we talked about down the road is um, also quite a success in other countries. It was um, There was made a version, I think, in, in Germany and Romania and other countries, uh, yeah. the Netherlands. Uh, it's uh, quite a big success. And uh, I want to ask you, what makes a format like that an international success? Well, down the road actually it's, 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 it's a beautiful journey. Yeah? It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good example how it can be successful and also how it, it, it's not so easy to market. Um, norm it's, it's, it's a docu-series and mm -hmm. docu-series are normally not formatted. So you can't claim an arena in yeah. television mm -hmm. because yeah, what's an arena? You can't... It's not like The Voice or The Masked Singer. It's not like you can make that program in different no, uh, you can, but you have to add format elements to it. Yeah. Um, mm. For down the road was, was, for instance, not something that we, we couldn't um, see up front. That's when we went to pitch in it in the US. Mm -hmm. um, the title, Down the Road, they're yeah. like, 
you can't make that. That's not possible. It's down the road. And they, they thought it was really offending because, and yeah, we because it was it's wordplay and it was a slang, but yeah, didn't it, do it, it, over there. Yeah, it okay. didn't work over there. And what we also see is that um, in uh, the more southern countries, um, that people there are not ready to see people with disabilities on screen. Mm -hmm. So that's something um, that uh, that we see. And in general, I think what is what is needed for an, a format to make it successful, yeah, you have to tell a story. You have to 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 give people a reason why they should buy it, and we have to have a reason why we make it. So that is something that's mm -hmm. uh, important. Timing is important. Um, Sometimes a good idea now or a good format now can just not work, but maybe it can land within two or three years or maybe in five years. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I said already was at the, um, you have to add some um, unique format elements um, to your format. A good example of that is um, the voice. Uh, it's yeah. not our format, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at the time that the voice was invented, there were already um, huge successes in talent shows. You had Belgium's Got, uh, you have the Got Talent shows. You had mm -hmm. the X Factor, Idols, and, and maybe Got Talent went later. Anyway, Idols and X Factor was already a big success. Mm -hmm. um, so, what could you do with another, not another uh, talent show? So, what they did was they add the chair. They add, added mm -hmm. the chair. And that was that unique uh, format element where yeah, the twist was so big, it became a new show. Yeah. The same with the masked singer. They added the masks, you have a new show. In the end, it's just a talent show. Mm -hmm. They just add something to it and it makes your format unique. And that's why you see that there are a lot of similar shows. You have dating shows, you have uh, talent shows. And every time you add something new, you have a unique selling point that you can use in format business. Um, on the other end, you see that you have to make sure that when you have a format that it also, and you want to be, you want it to be successful internationally, that you have formats that are easily adapted, can be easily adapted to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you can have um, a very successful bikini show in the Netherlands. It will never work in the Middle East, for instance. Yeah. That because of the um, cultural differences, or what sometimes also is. What can be difficult as well is you can have a very good format, but it's personality driven. For instance, here in Belgium, we have this um, great host, Tom Waas, great guy. Mm -hmm. um, and he used to present um, a show called Tom Testerom. Tom Testerom was a mm -hmm. show where he, as host, um, faced some, some of the biggest challenges in the world. He went to the most dangerous places, did some things that nobody would ever do as a hum human being. Well, he did. Well, actually, it was a good format. Um, it didn't sell. It didn't sell um, in internationally. Because you need that person to make that format work. You never. F yeah. No one could find uh, a guy that was as crazy as he <laughs> was <laughs> to to <laughs> present that show. So mm -hmm. that's also. So you have to have some yeah. luck. Um, you have the timing has to be correct. You mm -hmm. have to be unique. So there are a lot of elements that needs to fall yeah. uh, and come together. Um, I sometimes hear people say. Um, everything has been done or like everything has been rem invented and now ev everything is a remix of another um, format or another program and people are just rehashing ideas. Do you agree on that? Um, yes, in some way I do because it's true. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I don't think that's when you add something new, mm -hmm. I think it, uh, it can become a new show, more um, something fo from this time, for instance. Mm -hmm. We had, um, um, there is a format that we produce called uh, One Year Off, and it was actually, a, it's not our format. It, um, it's a format that was invented by um, a television host 15 years ago. It was a huge success on the public broadcaster. Mm -hmm. But the guy, uh, at the time, he was sick of all the entertainment business, so he quit. He moved to Sweden, went into the woods, and we never heard of him again. Yeah. Um, until a guy, um, an executive producer at our company, uh, Luc, said, that, that format, I think we can remake it now. We can add some things and we can redo it. Yeah, but where is the guy? He's in Sweden. We never, he didn't have a yeah. telephone. He couldn't reach him. He went to Sweden, went into the woods, found the guy, 
and convinced him to have a remake of. He actually went and, and he went into the yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Convinced him to have a remake yeah. on the show mm -hmm. and asked him his uh, his opinion about it. So we added some elements, made it from now, and you have uh, he produced five new series of it. Wow. So it's mm -hmm. okay that um, yeah that things come back. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, I, I want to go back to your role as um, like said a managing director mm -hmm. these days. Um, what is it, the main part of your job at Roses Are Blue? Except uh, everything managing, uh, it, it, it's kind of making sure everybody does what they're supposed to do and having the right talents on the right place. Is that yeah, I think f for me the main part is to make sure that um, creative people can be mm -hmm. creative without worrying it, worrying about everything else. That's actually what we try to do. I mm -hmm. think production people, um, everything of everybody is we who wants to become a producer um, has that um, needs to do that has yeah. to do that. Um, yeah, and I, I, as managing is managing a company. Yeah, being um, responsible for the people. See mm -hmm. that there is. Uh, um, an office and actually it's like a producer but then for a company. Yeah, what's the hardest part about doing that? Um, I think th for us the biggest lesson or the hardest part was w we started um, and y people when you start your own company and you're new at entrepreneur uh, as an entrepreneur so you have to be uh, aware of the finance financial risks and uh, uh, you have the creative challenge and blah 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 but the things I think are are Biggest challenges were the things that did people didn't warn us about. Um, and for instance, all of a sudden there was COVID. Yeah. And there you are <laughs> in the middle of just starting off your own company and uh, then uh, COVID entered. That was a challenge. And I think the biggest challenge there was the mental um, health of the people working in our company. How can we s keep them together as a group? How can we focus on their well-being, mental well-being, and how do we um, how do we avoid that they um, get isolated? For instance, that was a challenge. Um, what was also a challenge? We um, we lost two of our colleagues in the past mm -hmm. seven years. Uh, they passed away due to illness. That was a big challenge, um, and we found out that by creating this warm and um, human environment that that is so key of um, becoming um, a good group and a good group gives makes um, uh, gives people that feel comfortable and they are better creators when people feel comfortable and feel um, respected and feel um, well in a good place even when it's not it's the things are going bad because mm -hmm. they went pretty bad for us um, on some in some moments, um, yeah, having the f we wanted to give the people the feeling that they could be good, and uh, we are there in good and bad days. Actually, that's yeah. actually what I wanted to say. That was a big challenge because we didn't knew that upfront that some those things were going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then when you stick to your value values and you want to become a respectful company, you want to become a human company, mm -hmm. um, an open company where uh, people can be themselves. Yeah, we feel that is very, very important. Um, it's eventually managing people, yeah. and that's it's all a it's people everything. business. Our yeah. business is it's, it's people more business. than anything else. Um, well, I, I want to maybe uh, pick another subject, and that's um, the the technological. I wouldn't say difficulties, but changes we are facing these days, um, and, and you are facing as um, someone who is leading a production company. I'm just thinking at the top of my head of of streaming uh, is, is just uh, like you said in the beginning of our conversation um, when you were a child you watched linear television with like three programs a night um, that's completely unimagin unimaginable for people living these days uh, you, you have too many con uh, just too much content to even watch in a lifetime <laughs> it's um, how does a production company look at that is, is streaming um, an opportunity for you or is it more Concurrency, like um, well, it depends. It competing for us in in the local market, we see the um, the traditional broadcasters um, having all their own streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that's good for us. Uh, we have uh, 
several windows where we can uh, broadcast our uh, content yeah, the, on. The, the broadcasters these days have their own streaming um, besides streaming on television and streaming on... Uh, yeah, uh, but I mean the international, yeah. the, the Netflix of this world. Yeah. Uh, um, the giants. The yeah. giants. Um, yeah, we don't make um, fiction. We do, we do make non-fiction and we see an evolution of them um, going from fiction to non-fiction. Mm -hmm. We understand it, but uh, for instance, I don't know if you saw it, but there is the they make uh, a, a game show about the Squid Game. Yeah, yeah. Um, in real life. In real life, for instance. it was really good, it, but they had that immense budget. Mm -hmm. We can never compete to that, and we are um, we are interested mm -hmm. in working with them, but they're not so interested in our region. We are a Flemish-speaking region. That's not interesting for them. So when we want to compete or we want to pitch them for um, uh, uh, for non-fiction content, we have mm -hmm. to do it in English. So that's not our, our goal. Uh, so we'd like to um, stay local and try to put all our efforts into local content because mm -hmm. we believe local content that can travel um, internationally but start local because we mm -hmm. believe that even with the big streamers, people always are going to want to watch to people that talk their language, that they are recognizable um, in situations they recognize or in places that they can recognize. So I think we can make the difference in there. Mm -hmm. And how do you look at um, technological evolution on a, on a production level? For instance, um, these days crews are getting smaller and, and people making television. Um, for instance, back uh, back in the 1990s, there was a, a sound guy needed, uh, and a cameraman needed, a producer on set, a director, a journalist, all to make, like, make even a news item. Um, these days, it's all getting faster and smaller gear. Um, I'm not even talking about AI. And in the post-production, are you witnessing those those changes a lot? Yeah, I think the the crews. Mm -hmm. I. For the big television shows, mm -hmm. I don't think they're so much smaller. Okay. For television, um, yeah. uh, for television news, it is, but not for the television shows. But I think AI is a big challenge. Um, yeah. It's gonna replace a lot of um, um, jobs. Yeah. I think creating audio, um, mm -hmm. subtitling, translating, post production, post production side. side. Mm -hmm. I think in um, research. Mm -hmm. It can be helpful. It's going to make things a lot of easier and a lot of quicker. But it's we're still ba make taking baby steps there. Um, mm. And well, I for now, and it's going to I don't know which way it's going to go because it's going mm -hmm. so fast. We have to embrace it. We can't deny it. We can't say we're not going to be yeah. part of that. We have to embrace Being it. Being stubborn and saying that we don't use no, it. No, we can't. We can't. You have to embrace it. And then mm -hmm. um, I think for now it's uh, more like an inspirational tool. Okay. Uh, it gives a, it gives content people or content creators more inspiration than they mm -hmm. have to rethink everything themselves. So I think the human part will always be important to add on top of all um, yeah evolutions uh, in innovation and technical innovation. It's a tool and we should use it, but never it's lose our human business. touch. It's a people business. It will always yeah. stay people business. Okay, uh, then I would maybe like to look at the future. Um, first off, your future, where do you want to go with? With Roses Are Blue and with, with the company in, well, in the long term? We always said that um, we wanted to conquer the world. <laughs> that was <laughs> the main... <laughs> that we wanted to make television um, and at first for our formers to travel uh, internationally and then um, second of all we want to be uh, we want to produce uh, also in other countries and uh, I think we managed well so far because we have now a production company in the Netherlands and we have one in uh, Germany mm -hmm. um, and that combined with uh, Caviar Group who is um, now um, active in LA in UK in Paris, so in France, so yeah. we're a bit all over all, all over the world. Um, so that is the main um, focus for the future. Is uh, there is a big consolidation round going on in the world? All the big uh, entertainment companies are merging or getting together. Mm -hmm. So we focus on those um, little independent producers 
and try to collaborate as much as we can uh, yeah. to have like a bigger answer of big answer to the mm -hmm. uh, big entertainment groups. But still going global with, I would say, the local talents yeah. and the local. And let's yeah. let these formats travel within those mm -hmm. companies yeah. that we can. We don't have to sell it to the big okay. ones. Yet. And <laughs> and maybe, uh, do you have anything uh, to say? Would it would it good career that you had to um, people now emerging from film schools or um, students who would like to pursue a career in media or even producing what would you say to uh, young aspiring television producers to keep in mind uh, oh there's a lot to tell <laughs> <laughs> uh, please go for it <laughs> yeah. uh, there is uh, I think there will always be room for good content mm -hmm. uh, whether it is on a stream or, or on online or uh, on TikTok or on linear. Um, maybe something that I didn't mention before and um, mm -hmm. because it's quite interesting. Yeah. When you see the streamers, um, uh, they, um, they there is a, uh, this evolution that they are investing in live entertainment. Oh and yeah. actually, that's like a linear mm -hmm. thing, live entertainment. You have to watch it now. Uh, yeah. It's most of the time sports mm -hmm. but i think they will go for concerts and things like that so there will yeah. be an evolution that it's all coming back <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, the, the big difference that they had on linear television that you could watch it anywhere and anytime is actually going back it's to going back you have to watch it at this time yeah it's quite ironic but yeah <laughs> it is it's, it's good quite one ironic. to keep in mind <laughs> everything everything is remix and everything is coming back everything is coming <laughs> back so i'm okay. really um um well, I'm, I'm curious about what it's going to, to yeah, be. Yeah, we're all curious about the future. Um, I, th I think maybe... Uh, maybe some, oh some things for, oh for, yeah. the for your um, students, uh, for everybody here, um, yeah. is I think f the main... What I learned is you should always be passionate about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Whether you, you're on camera, whether you whatever you do, when you do it in media, you have to be passionate. It's really yeah. important. And never lose the bigger picture. Mm. Always go... What do you mean with the bigger picture? Where, where you want to go, where you want to end, please go, go there. Don't lose your sense in details. Don't, when people, sometimes you're gonna um, bump into people that don't like you, that, not, that don't like what you're making. Mm -hmm. Never lose your dream, just follow it and, and go for it. And what I think it's important for, for you guys is that you don't, uh, be, don't ever be afraid of, ask, of asking for feedback. Um, and when you ask for feedback, never take it personally. Mm -hmm. Please focus on um, on what you're making and when people, because when you ask feedback, you, you become like a bit of vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's, it's yeah. you're, a, you're a creator and you're making something that's an emotional process. But by asking people for feedback, you're going to become bet a better version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you ask for feedback, never take it personally. I think that's... Yeah, and people sometimes fear asking for feedback because um, you, you think you would bother like people who are longer in the industry or people who are busy. Oh, don't. And please don't. Yeah. No. Just ask. The most of and them and are... And yeah. when I say don't take it personally, that means mm. that also means, yeah, if people can add something, listen to it. Mm -hmm. If, if you don't, if you don't want to change it, it's okay. You can be stubborn if you like, but don't let your ego um, become uh, more important than your project. That's yeah. also a thing. So listen to people because th when they give feedback, it's always feedback. It's, it can be good or bad, but it's always Never good to criticism listen. criticism about you, but about it's always yeah. about what you're making. That's good to, uh, to take. That's a good. That's good feedback for like. Just people uh, watching this. Um, maybe um, if I'm talking about the audience, we have some people here. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to ask something to Anna. Anyone here has a question? Oh, this lovely lady behind me. <laughs> I have a question. <coughs> Do you prefer uh, shows or traveling documentaries? Personally, yes. um, I prefer shows, but that's just a really, it, it's a personal um, interest because I'm, I'm, li I'm actually I'm one of the only ones in our production company who has that interest. <laughs> <laughs> the most of the people uh, prefer the, uh, the traveling uh, series. And why shows? I don't, I think I'm, I think I like the show business, the entertainment part, the big, uh, 
lights, the show, the music, where it all, it all comes together, but that's just the personal. Uh, that was where you started as well. Uh, yeah. Really yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody else? Okay. Over there. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm curious about, so I've heard your great journey. Do you have the feeling you accomplished your dream? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have never the feeling that I'm going to work. Mm -hmm. I never had that. I'm, I'm not going to work. I'm, I, l I love what I do. And um, so, yeah, I think I, I accomplished my dream, yeah. Okay. And I'm still dreaming. Keep on dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, someone else? Oh, yeah. This maybe, side. maybe a last one. Hi, Ender. Thank you for your time. I'm curious. Uh, if you could go back in time, would you do it the same way? Or would you start with your company immediately after graduation? And why? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, in terms of making money, I would have started the day <coughs> as, as ended, <laughs> ended up my studies. But I think I needed the um, the journey uh, in between uh, after I uh, in between um, starting work and starting my own business um, to have the learnings to do what I do now. But if I knew what I <laughs> back then, what I know I know now. I would have started immediately <laughs> with my own company. Yeah, yeah that's uh, besides the experience, no, of course. Um, OK, these are not the only people who've watched this conversation. Um, if it's good, we also have some questions from people who watched it online all over Europe. Tamara, are you there? OK. Uh, yes, thank you, Felix. Um, looks like we have a few questions here that will be maybe interesting for us to hear your answer on. Um, our viewers are very curious and interested in the production process and behind the scenes in general. Um, how big is a production team supposed to be and how many people does it take to manage that? Well, that depends on the kind of program you make. Um, for instance, and down, down the road is in the pre-production phase, it's um, the research team preparing the route, preparing uh, the casting and uh, doing the casting. Um, so I think it's about, you have a producer, an assistant, uh, a chief editor, two editors, six, six or seven people. The director becomes more important once you go into the, of, um, towards the um, shooting um, phase. And then in when they start to travel and they shoot, it's, it's with the camera crews. And then I think the, the team is about 30 people on the road. But for instance, we make Summer Hit, which is a big um, television uh, show on the at the coast. Uh, we have a crew of 120 people running around. So it depends on what kind of show you make. Um, but the, 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 the key people, the, the key production team um, is most of the time not so big. You have like the producers, two, one or two assistants, and then the executive producers, some editors, and then the chief editor. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, we still have a few more, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, seeing that uh, most of our viewers are students, of course, um, we're all wondering, how did you decide what you wanted to become after your studies? Was it a struggle? Um, did you already know what you had in mind for the future? Um, how did that go for you? Well, I, I, as I said, I wanted to become a journalist uh, because I loved writing. Um, and by doing an internship, I, um, yeah, I felt that's not what I want to do. I, I prefer doing this, th uh, the other side. Um, uh, so production, the production side. Um, I was lucky that I could um, kept keep on working um, in the company where I did an internship. I was like in my second year, and then they asked me as a student during the holidays and then actually I was already working at uh, the company during my last year of studies because I was in this production process um, of a, a big gala show and um, they wanted to keep me so they called school so can she work three days here and then go three days to school and school approved so <laughs> I was lucky to do that so um, I, I could start immediately after I finished my studies at that place also. So. And did you have any 
big challenges that you faced while pursuing that and into becoming a managing director of uh, Rosa or Blue? I'm sure you faced a lot of challenges. How do you face those challenges? How do you deal with them? I think there's, um, yeah, there is one thing. During my um, period as a managing director, I also lost my husband. Um, it was in 2019, two years after we started the company. So for me personally, that was a really, a really big challenge because the company was in this growth modus and I was in grief and I didn't want people let that, I didn't want anyone letting down. Um, but of course I, uh, I took some rest. But when I came back, I think my, and, and that's something that you can all uh, take with you. There was something I learned and, and that is, I have to accept the things you have to accept the things you cannot change. And that um, is in the case in personal life. In this case, it was like, I have lost my husband, but I have to continue. And I chose to continue because I can't change that he's gone, but I can focus on, on anything else. And actually, I learned at that point that I can rely on everything also in the business. Sometimes when things go wrong, just focus on that not on what happened and what you cannot change, but most of the time you're not in control of, of what's going on or what went wrong, but just focus on what you can do and where you can make the difference. And I think that is, it was the biggest challenge, but my biggest lesson in life. I have one more, uh, I have one more question for you. A final question would be, um, how do you feel about what you achieved today, till this day, about where you are in life? How do you feel about it? I think I'm proud. <laughs> I'm proud of, um, I'm happy um, where I am and I am also proud of what uh, I've, I've achieved. And I think I'm most proud that I'm doing what I love to do. Not that I'm the title or having the company, it's good, it's nice, it's, uh, but doing what I love, it's my most, it's my biggest achievement. That is, uh, for me personally, it's, it gives me more, um, how do you say it, Voldoening satisfaction. Sat yeah. um, th the biggest satisfaction is that, doing what I love, <coughs> doing most. Uh, thank you so much, Anta, for answering our questions. And thank you so much for the inspiring talk and being with us here today. Um, now I would like to give the mic back to Felix. Thank you, Tamara. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tamara. Um, well, I was going to say the same thing. Thank you for being here. Um, I learned a lot, really, um, from this conversation. It was really insightful. Um, and I, I want to thank you uh, for being here, for talking to us. Thank I also want to thank the, the crew uh, of Narafi Multicam for making this possible, for doing the sound, editing, light, everything. Um, and then I want to thank Film EU also for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, talk with us. and. I want to thank you um, all over Europe who are watching this right now. Um, and hopefully we see you again in another Film EU talk in the next time. Goodbye. Thank you.